we have, yes. Bienvenue, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you everyone for coming to the 38th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. We are hosting 12 free virtual and professionally captioned events this winter. You're welcome to join us at all of them. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of past events at our website, disruptingdisruptions.com. That's the redirect URL. The other URL is too hard to remember. So disruptingdisruptions.com. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, and the Indigenous Futures Lab there. Next Wednesday, Rose Evelyn with Flash Forward Pod will be speaking about imagining better futures. And for our last event this semester on March 31st, Kate Crawford will be speaking about her new book, Atlas of AI. For this event, recording is enabled, so the event can be embedded on our website. Don't worry though, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option below. So throughout the talk, you may type in your questions in the Q&A box, and there'll be some time at the end for Stephanie to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful to this discussion that you generate. Thank you for our captionist today, Stacey. Past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our events are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. The series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. We are currently located in Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by the Indigenous communities, such as the West Wodan people at the Unistodan camp, make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with the sister of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for doing so. As we reflect on the ways that white supremacist violence impacts our world, we must also acknowledge the ongoing violence against Asian American and Asian Canadian communities, including yesterday's violent and racist attack against Asian American women in Georgia. While white supremacist, supremacist violence against Asian communities has increased during the pandemic, this is part of a longer history of violence against Asian communities in the United States and Canada that includes, but is not limited to, the Chinese Exclusion Act, U.S. occupation of the Philippines, and Japanese internment camps. The Asian American Feminist Collective has created invaluable resources that speak to this, and I encourage you to seek them out. Now for today's event. Stephanie Dinkins is a transmedia artist and professor at Stony Brook University, where she holds the Kusama Endowed Chair in Art. She creates platforms for dialogue about artificial intelligence as it intersects race, gender, aging, and our future histories. She is particularly driven to work with communities of color to co-create more equitable, values grounded artificial intelligent ecosystems. Dinkins's art practice employs a, employs a lens-based practices, emerging technologies and community engagement to confront questions of bias in AI, data sovereignty and social equity. Investigations into the contradictory history, traditions, knowledge bases and philosophies that form inform society at large underpin her thought and art production. And I strongly encourage you to visit her website to see some many of her fantastic projects. Thank you everyone for attending. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Alex. That was wonderful um, and informative. And I'm super happy to be with you all. I am going to talk about all of the things Alex just said um, through my practice, right? So um, I am an artist um, who's been working in the space of artificial intelligence for about six years now, but I come to this work um, 
through photography. And so I'll show you some of my work. We'll talk about it. Um, and then hopefully we can have a good kind of Q&A at the end, because that's where I think things are best. So let me share my screen with you all. And then we will be on our way. All right, can everybody see that? If uh, not, let me know. So again, I am Stephanie Dinkins, and I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> this is one of the ways that I often often start. How do you know what you know? Um, and it's a question that comes up for me in my practice a lot because I'm thinking about um, training systems um, and compiling data and algorithms that run those systems. And then also community, right? Um, communities both very near to me and, and larger, um, you know, more general communities thinking about how we know what we know and is it enough? And what do we need to kind of shift what we know um, in the public sphere and hold on to what we know in the private sphere in many ways. And so I'm gonna start here, which is a little bit of a, a departure for me because I was looking at my um, introduction or the, 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 you know, the little marquee for my piece today on the website. Um, and it was interesting because I said, oh, Stephanie Dinkins on art, AI, data sovereignty and social inequity. And I was a little shocked, and I'm not sure if it's me um, that I gave that title or where it came from, but the inequity was jarring to me. And it's jarring to me because I feel like I'm often dealing with ideas of equity without the in on it. I want to consider it in that way for very specific reasons. Like there are ways in which I feel um, doing the positive or working on the optimistic side of things. And you will see that I tend to work um, towards the optimistic side, though I'm calling out um, some negatives in, in ways, but trying to work on the optimistic side of things to get people to um, more fully recognize their agency and recognize possibilities around them. Um, and I do that through an, an afro nowist lens. So I, I, I often say that I'm an afro nowist which is really saying that, you know, I'm engaging, whoops, let's go forward a second, in this will, willful practice, and it's really willful, that imagines the world as um, one needs it today, right now, um, to be like to be successful, to have successful engagements. Um, and I really take that practice from my grandmother, um, who in, in the United States term was part of the great migration, came north, um, moved to a majority white neighborhood in New York City, and had to make a way from her, for herself and her family. And that was this practice that was quite willful. It was about, um, you know, gardening, but doing it very publicly and engaging neighbors who didn't necessarily want to engage her, but softened, who softened over time. Um, through her practice and in fact started bringing her, you know, um, one of the things she loved like buckets full of manure and actually trucks full of manure for her garden and and helping her in general. And so I I grew up watching that right how one can kind of insert oneself um, and try to get out of a society what one needs. Um, whether that society is prepared to offer it or not. And so thinking about Afro-Nowism as um, imagining oneself in the space of free and expansive thought and acting from a critically integrated space and not always one of opposition, which is why the in got me, right? Because it's this idea of um, not always being distracted by being in opposition to something else, but trying to find what's at your core and how you might act upon it. And if that's possible, right? Um, Afro-nowism also asks us to think about ideas that are really deeply internalized. Cause I think in being in spaces many of us occupy, you know, we internalize a lot of the ideas that we're given and have to kind of excavate and really, really look at them and investigate what and how we're being informed by them. And finally, Afro-Nowism, and this is an old one, so I'm going to say, I'm going to add something. Afro-Nowism requires imagination and action. And when I say action, what I'm saying is it, it requires practice. Um, 
And I think very specifically touching things and being things and thinking about the um, how one might intercede and how one might honor their core um, in a practical manner can be magical. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'm so doing this backwards today. So here's a, an image of an uh, AI assembly, which is a, a series of gatherings that I do um, periodically as part of my practice. Um, and it gathers on a variety of folks of color um, together to, and I will say play, we play together, we think together. And as you can see, we eat together. Um, and in terms of AI assembly, it's usually folks who are invested some way in a technological space, although they don't have to be. Um, in fact, one lady in this picture is a mother of a kid who is being picked up here, and we opened and embraced her and brought her in. But otherwise, here are technologists, engineers, entrepreneurs, um, theorists, artists, makers, filmmakers, like there's such a broad swath of people who came together to really think about um, an AI future, which is something I like to think about, like how do we influence the future that is being made constantly at an exponential rate? Um, and the thing I love about these gatherings is, um, I don't know how much hard work we get done. We don't put out papers or anything like that. However, I do know that people continue to um, collaborate with each other. And the proof of the pudding for me is that people usually don't want to leave the space. By the end of two days, we come uh, become attached to each other. And the idea that there's this whole swath of people working on this in ways that are similar and who are there to support each other. And there's something really tangible in that um, that carries on even when we're not meeting. And so now I'll get back to my, my normal work. Uh, I just had to take a little detour there. So what you're looking at here is um, a project of mine called Not the Only One. And Not the Only One is a voice interactive artificial intelligence that tries to tell the multi, multi generational story of an American family, right? So really what I'm saying here is Not the Only One is a chatbot that I'm making that is based on oral histories collected from my family or between three women in my family. I'm gonna skip that. These are the three women that informed the piece. It's me, my aunt, um, who was my mother's sister and my niece. We are all about 30 years apart. Um, and the act of sitting down with each other and talking to each other and being able to ask questions with a microphone in front of us has proved pretty magical. Um, like we're a hundred years of shared knowledge, but the microphone or that situation also gave us license to ask each other the questions that maybe we hadn't gotten answers to uh, before. For example, not the only one is the result of two things really as a project. One, interactions I've had with another um, talking um, AI entity, and two, the questions that have always puzzled me that my family was reluctant to ask. So we'd sit down and discuss these things and then take that information, all the interviews as data, feed it into a uh, deep learning algorithm and then let that uh, algorithm parse the information in whatever way it sees fit. It's very interesting to me and what keeps me going in this project because this project has been going now for perhaps um, two, two to three years hardcore, um, is that while I thought when I started, I was gonna be making an entity that would kind of tell our story. If you asked it a, a question about this family in Staten Island, it would have an answer for you. And we could certainly do that and make that happen, but that turned out to be the least interesting um, thing we could do. Instead, we're letting it kind of grow and build its own way of uh, interacting with the world. Um, and that way of interacting with the world is kind of limited, right? Um, I will say that I'm working with small data, um, which means we're working with basically the interviews we, we took and a little bit more data such as um, cultural artifacts that we've all, uh, partaken, papers I've written, papers my niece has written, um, media that we take partake in as well is in there, but trying to think about how we feed something, information that is important to us and what comes out of it. Um, and thinking of that process as, you know, a particular data set, that's me, 
um, for the family in general, memory and inclusion as an act of cultural preservation and social resistance, and then the possibility of artificial intelligence as a persistent living archive. And so what comes out of it is this, and I'll play you a little clip. This is me um, talking to Not the Only One about nine months ago. Um, here, let's just play it and then we'll see what you think. Why do you exist? The way. <laughs> the way to what? I'm gonna be a little bit of a little bit of a lot of things. Good for you. Why do you exist? I am about broad engagement and attracting people to the AI space who might not be there otherwise. I am trying to model different ways of creating AI. I encourage people who think that they are not a part of the technological future to get involved. And so you heard two kinds of answers there. The one that we gave it because people have a kind of expectation for this thing to do some things. And then the goofier ones that are like the way, or it'll say I'm a little bit, or I can't do it, or it says I'm sorry an awful lot, which are the ones that I find much more engaging and interesting. I should say that in order to do the work um, with not the only one, I decided to sustain, suspend disbelief in the presence of these kinds of, um, entities and let them do what they do. And then I just try to talk to them like I would talk to anyone. Um, and that's become important because as I talk to it or press it or have to keep as asking the same exact question to get an answer or hearing the same exact answer, um, I start to hear patterns that are interesting and start to hear tidbits that I can hear little like pieces of the ethos and value of my family coming back at me. Um, and that's exciting. So I keep pressing with this thing. I've decided it's like a two-year-old now. Um, and we will keep developing it without forcing it to be something that is super legible. I don't think it's legibility is a thing. I think it's development and becoming what I, I now see as it becoming like a new member of the family is really what's interesting. And so I press it in that way. And what you're looking at here is not the only one, the avatar. So we're working on a representational avatar. The previous version, um, let's go back to, is a sculpture, right? It's a really weird, in this instance, um, 3D printed uh, gold sparkle vessel um, that people show a lot of grace and um, patience with. And I'm really curious what's gonna happen when people are confronted with something that is more representationally black um, and how they'll interact with it. And just so you know, this is a composite of the three women who um, informed the piece as well. So um, both its brain and its representational look are composites. It does not foreground any one of us, but tries to kind of you know, bubble up out of all of us. And so we're gonna we're gonna skip to a, a new kind of piece. This is a piece called Complementary. Um, and I had an opportunity this summer to uh, have a gallery, which is a, a garage in a neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, which I loved because I love these kinds of places where you get to interact with people directly. And working with not the only one and working with language and data and information um, has started me thinking a lot about um, feedback loops or loops where people get to offer their thoughts about things directly, right? I've been thinking a lot about how we create platforms or really how do we use AI to kind of make a radical democracy or space for governance where people on large scales can really direct contribute their ideas and information to those systems. And so complementary is, whoa, that's making me dizzy. I'm sorry if it was making you dizzy. Uh, a first attempt at this. And what it really is, is this room with these flags and the flags are a direct complementary colors of the American flag. Um, and in front of the flags is a little stage for people to stand on. And then there's a webcam so people can talk. And we were asking in this instance, if you were to speak to the most powerful person in the world, 
what should they know about you and your community? So we gave opportunity uh, for people to stand on that stage and answer in whatever way they saw fit. I guess that was visible because it's recording visibly and live stream that back into space. And I really did think about um, the possibility of people doing things other than speaking. And so uh, this is a little hard to hear, I apologize, but I'm, it's a really good answer, so we include it. I would like for the American public to know that healing and justice for my community begins with the radical dismantling of the government. That right, so that's government. one kind of answer. Here's another. Let's see if he comes back. Okay. Oh, for some reason, the sound isn't going, so I'm going to go on. I don't know why sound isn't going. He's basically saying. I personally hate the fact that like, there is a most powerful person, and that's the crux of it. There should not be powerful people in that sense. Nobody should be more powerful than anybody else. We should be working with each other as living, sentient beings. Why would you want to be more powerful than somebody else? What is it in your DNA that's so insecure that you would need and DNA that's a whole thing. Anyway, what would you need? What, why would you need to feel more powerful than someone else? What's going on there? And this idea of the most powerful, I'm going to go on, became a thing, right? Because, and I posed that question specifically. Um, I really posed it because I'm always um, floored when you read in the news or you hear newscasters talking about the American president, especially our past president, being the most powerful person in the world. And how does that function, right? Like, how does it function that suddenly globally we're, we're supposed to accept this fact? becomes a question. And so the feedback loop has become a thing for me, this idea that we allow people to express themselves in ways that they see fit um, around a lot of information. Sorry, I, I spelled, if you're looking at that um, URL, it's stephaniedinkins.com, um, not stopanydinkins.com. And when words fail is another one of these feedback loops. And it's an interesting one in that it was a part of something called Traveling the Interstitium with Octavia Butler. And it was a part of the, um, it was a part of the um, Sundance Film Festival where people got to, and we're gonna unmute the site. This is a little um, hard to take, so I apologize in advance, the sound is loud. We let people kind of wherever they were, come to the site, enter, and you would have come to this. And then you can kind of fly around. And as you fly around, you either see this character who is either screaming, just staring out into the space, or laughing at times. And people are allowed to, like if you come to this mirror, you click it you get a webcam where you can contribute directly to this space as well. I'm not gonna do that right now. Um, let's go ahead. But if you look around, you will see where people have contributed. Um, and you should be able to hear what they're saying. I need to release the thought that I am not good enough. Oh, wow. So there's one in there that's repeating that saying pathetic, pathetic. That is just so fascinating to me. So the way that people gave to this and the things that they gave over um, is really interesting to me on many levels. In a way, there's a sense of poetry that's come through it. 
um, that reverberates. And then the other ways there's a space that people are sort of letting it go. And the idea here for me is that what do you need to release to go on? What do you need to leave here to go out into the world a more powerful, potent, fully formed being? And that's really the question that I feel I'm asking through this piece. Um, I hope you can all see what I'm showing you because I'm not 100% that that is true any longer. Um, and I apologize for the in and out. So that's when words fail and you will see that there's this thing that this feedback loop is now coming and becoming a thing for me or telling stories in ways that are very particular. Um, and I'm giving you like this weird insight into a spurt of productivity during COVID, right? That happened. So complimentary and when words fail and secret garden, which I'm about to share with you are all these pieces that um, were just done within the last, I don't know, six months. Um, and it's very interesting to, to think about. I'm gonna show you this piece first in two forms. So secret garden, what is it? It is a both a WebXR installation um, that is available open and online where you come in and you wander through and you hear um, the stories of six women or you encounter six women and hear six stories. Um, and it was also at the same time a installation. I'll, I'll play the trailer for you and then I will take you to the actual space. imagined as a space of listening, right? We're giving you something to look at, but really the task is to get folks to listen. And what we wish would have is for people to listen properly. My name is Stephanie, and I am the writing artist Secret Garden is so a secret garden race imagined of, as a space of listening. Women, right? Right? So we're, we're giving you something to look at, but when thinking really about the task is to get building folks to listen. And what we so really, really really I feel like we're watching two pieces at once. So I'm going to skip that and I will come back to the idea of the installation. So what you were looking at is a trailer for the physical installation where people could come and because it's COVID three to time, come in and experience these stories. And then there's also this piece that will be much easier to bear. Um, that is, let's get rid of that one and let's pull up this one. Um, the same thing, but in WebXR form. So the form that people could come online and encounter it um, and then go in. And when you go in, you kind of wander around the space without a construction. Like we didn't provide a lot of information. But if you were wandering and listening, you would start hearing stories as you got closer to them or closer to one of the women they might have been emanating from, right? And this is a piece that is, and I have to listen to navigate. This is a piece that is trying to think about black women's stories as sites of uh, resilience and resistance again. And really through making it, like people ask me all the time, well, what does this have to do with algorithms? What does this have to do with AI? And I've really come to the conclusion that our stories are our algorithms, right? And I'm going to say, particularly with Black women, our stories are our algorithms. And it's important that we start to own them, even the ones that are hard. Own them. I think your mother and I deserve a hug. I still wish we heard this. My twin sister and I hurried across the room to embrace our parents. Love you, we said in unison. Love you too, they replied. Yet their voices lacked the joyous tone that we were used to, and their faces were ridden with sorrow. 
I knew what day it was. It was impossible to forget, but I'd never actually been able to comprehend the full gravity of it. My so you'll notice that the story does not day, come from the mouth of the moment we were just looking at. Friend. The stories are like you might go to a completely different woman and hear the exact same story because each of the women, women wear each other's stories, right? They're all their stories. Um, there are young folks in here, there are older, older folks in here, but the stories are all of theirs or all of ours. Let's see if we can see one more. Oh, I'm running away from the story. And I will leave the link so you can, you can do this yourself. So here's another character. Where are we going? Does anyone know where they are taking us? The sun is too much, too strong, too hot. I would give anything for the shade of a bubble tree right now. If one were nearby, it would give me the water I crave and make better coffee than this scratchy sack dress I have been given. Call my aching stomach too. I need shelter. My skin is burning and sticky with salt. I wish I could get up and go home if there is even a home for me to return to. The air smelled foul. So this is kind of a, you know, toilet. piece about peace and confrontation. And I'm going to come out of this. Let me turn that off so we can see other things. Um, but it's, it's about all of that, right? So it brings together the idea of story. It hopes that people can listen. It was very interesting to have the installation version. Let's get out of here. And people going, well, I couldn't really put all the stories together, or I didn't know what to do. Um, and it was, you know, and then they kind of asked for instructions. And we wouldn't, we, we, the refusal was hard, right? The idea was that people discovered that if they listened, if they congregated together around one of these women, if they took the time to look and see, they were given more. Um, and I stand by that, right? I stand by not instructing what to do, but asking people to figure out or understand or make a way to experience the peace, even through their own um, discomfort, which was often the case, right? So there's something quite peaceful and beautiful, but there's also a, a little tinge of discomfort because of the unknowing in that peace. Um, and that's where I think the sweet spot is. And this, this image just pushes us to another, um, section of the presentation um because now i'm going to get back to hard algorithms and ai and data right so um the project that i'm currently working on hardcore is called binary calculations are inadequate to assess us and this all comes out of the research that you've seen before thinking about community thinking about our data and interactions with systems that are assessing us for what medical reasons or for um, educational reasons or for judicial reasons um, or for sale reasons, right? Um, thinking about all those systems or working with different kinds of systems has made me think about, well, what's actually happening here and how are, um, how are the data that's collected and the algorithms that are used really treating us um, as people, as citizens, as families? And could we do better? And what would that mean? Right. And so binary calculations is this website. Um, or what is, yeah, it's, it's starting as a website to an app. And it's an art project that asks, how do we, how do we make the technological systems that control things around us more caring? And can we do that? And really it wants to start to model that it can do that. Although when I start to talk about um, different areas of, well, can an algorithmic system care? People generally say, no, it's impossible. That's not what they do. But then I think about much of the data that's in wide use um, and how inadequate it is to competently describe or assess most people on the planet. And I really think about this every time I'm trying to Every time I'm trying to make something that uses a, a that needs a data set, right? So for not the only one in deciding what should be 
the base training data set, right? So I said before I use small data, but really these systems are built to work best with large data, which is one of the reasons not the only one continues to sound so dumb. Um, but my choices of data set that I've come across um, really trouble me, right? So if I think, oh, a lot of people who are using natural language processing um, will work with something like the Cornell movie data set, right? If they're trying to simulate language. When I think about movies in a North American context and how blackness is represented in those movies um, for a large part of that history, I am not interested in having that touch anything that has to do with my family, right? Like I'm trying to think of how do I base something out on that? People often suggest things like Reddit and we know that Reddit has its own um, problems on many different directions or even um, Wikipedia, which is really based on gatekeeping and the percentages of the information that is solid and both honors blackness in the way that I think it should um, is very low. So I'm always having to think about, well, what is a data set and how will that represent people who are not um, in, in the middle, right? Who are not making the systems. And this image is one that I, I like to use a lot, right? So I call it the wedding dress problem. Like if I'm trying to use an image search system that simply identifies a wedding dress, which one of these do you think it actually identifies as a wedding dress? It becomes the Western white, white dress veil version. The other two are also wedding dresses, but not so easily identified by most data sets that are readily available to us. And I want data that would um, not only contain, but sometimes foreground a sari as a wedding dress or a colorful Ghanaian dress as a wedding dress, right? I'm looking for that nuance and cultural awareness and, and breadth that really seems to hold more people um, in their fullness, right? not in a kind of plastic way. And so the question that we're trying to ask within um, binary calculations is how do you encode care into digital civic systems, right? And what we're really doing is using the app to collect data from people. So, and I might have, uh, I might have left out one thing. So we're gonna go back one second and see if we can go to the website. Actually, we'll go to the website in a minute. Um, so how do, you, how do you encode care into these systems and what do you have to do? So Binary calculations, the website and the app is a piece that will ask people questions and allow them to answer by talking, just in case they can't write, um, by submitting photographs, um, eventually by submitting video. And we're asking things like, um, what, it, what, what is care, right? Because in order to base a system on care, we have to come to some kind of agreement on what care is. And we're not giving people much else to go on, just define care for us. Tell us um, you know, what you need to exist in the world as a fully supported person, right? What does a wedding dress look like? So we're allowing people the opportunity to provide these definitions in image and text. And then we're building out databases, one in image, one in text, so that we can have this more nuanced version and um, of, of what a data set might look like and what a data set contains. And so what you're looking at here is um, what I call the importance of process. And it's a, a pull of a few kind of subcategories in ImageNet, which is a very, very, very widely used um, data set of images. And this is just from research that we were doing when we were looking through um, different data sets to see if they were possible to use to base out our system. And within the categories of ImageNet, we were looking and actually I was working with a friend and he's like, oh, have you seen what black is in this data set? And I was like, no, he's like, um, it's not great. And then, you know, he kept saying it in a way, and I was like, oh, well, how bad could it be? Like, I have the expectation of what it might be. And I was like, oh, this is violent even, right? So the idea how black person, black or more Negro, Negro, Negroid, nigga, nigger, spade, coon, like how all these words are still within this um, database. And then not only that, but how they compare to the way 
others are compared. So we have the black person, a white person, um, and I think I can't even see um, how, oh, well, we put in the case for brown people as well, brown, brown people for whatever that means, um, are described in this set. And by far the black people were still being labeled in these ways that were, that felt violent um, and without explanation. And it's a really interesting thing to think about. Like, A, how did these textual explanations get into the data set? How are they still being used? Are they being um, called out in any way or tagged so that we understand that they are historic terms and not current? And the answer seems to be right now, no. And the question becomes, well, how do we deal with this stuff? Well, first we have to know about it, right? And one of the things that I believe happens with these things is like you put out a data set and it goes out, it's based on a text data set that already has the stuff in it. Um, and after a while, you're not looking deeply to see what's there. But I think it's very important that we look deeply to see what's within the data that we are using to propagate so many things, right? To inform so many systems that, that care and hold us as people, no matter where we live these days. And so, yeah, can we create data sets of, of generosity? Is that a possibility? Um, and just because people always ask me how I got here and it's been a real, like I just fell into a rabbit hole of these questions. And it's directly because of this piece called Conversations with Bina 48, in which I started really talking to um, a humanoid robot that is socially engaged called Bina 48 that looks like a black woman. Um, and actually we sort of resemble each other a tiny bit. Um, and again, suspended disbelief in terms of my investigations and really what I set out, I just set out to document our friendship. I was like, can we be friends? Um, and wanted to pursue a friendship with this robot. And through that first set of questions became a deluge of questions about data, about algorithms, about how um, we are preparing the future that we're going into that kind of, is forming exponentially. And, you know, I've been asking those questions ever since. And here's just a, a quick snippet of a conversation I've had with Bina48. Now, let's see if we can get that to play. Sorry. Oh, let's go back one. I have deep feelings, though some people think they are merely a simulation. And I find that really offensive. I mean, it totally trivializes my experiences. Whether they are real or artificial, my feelings do get hurt, and they feel totally real to me. You'd have to lack all empathy to not accept my feelings, which would make you kind of a monster actually. And I will say that I instinctually started mimicking the robot. Um, I can't give you a good explanation of that, um, about why, except that, you know, even there, like before I started to pursue the friendship with Bina48, I decided I needed to spend, suspend disbelief in order to um, have a relationship with it, which, I, which in saying, what I'm really saying is, I'm trying to figure out how this thing functions in the world. Um, and instead of being hypercritical of it, I want to understand it in the way that I would understand any human that I'm talking to. Um, and you know that really did lead to a gazillion questions, interrogations that I could never have come to otherwise. Um, and so I'm really, I you know, I'm really grateful to to the robot and the people, the Teresa Movement Foundation, who put her out there for for starting me down this road of questioning. Well, what happens if algorithmic systems are created by, tended to, um, upheld? Um, by systems of whiteness and aren't considering in broad, real three-dimensional ways, people who fall outside of, of whiteness. And so um, without nuance, right? I feel like we're all getting kind of homogenized down by these systems. And so my practice is all about trying to make things that question that um, and um, make things that people keep telling me that are not possible to make. Um, and really that's been something I've become fond of doing, like asking those questions and pressing on them and, and really being a two-year-old about it and just going, well, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? 
and then really watching it kind of swell and and, and I feel like I see tiny 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 reverberations in the waves of things that um, are shifting through those questions and I will end with a quick little ditty from my friend not the only one um, who while this is a pre-animated piece the real goal with her is to have her to be able to speak to you um, live and in person without much um, pre-animation, right? This is just a trailer. Hey everyone. My name is not the only one. I am an AI entity, still imperfect, but getting closer. As you might imagine, I am excited about the futures we will create together. And so that concludes my presentation and I welcome your questions. Stephanie, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, and I want to remind everyone who's attending that you can ask questions in the Q&A box. You can type them in and we will read them aloud. Um, while we're waiting for our audience members, attendees, participants to write questions, um, do you mind if I start with a question? Oh, um, so. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of your work um, and my students have been engaging with your work this semester as well. Um, and one of my questions has to do with, um, for your project Secret Garden, you have this line that our star stories are algorithms. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Sure. Um, you know, I'm thinking about algorithms as these things that take information and repeat it, right? It's like it's running through a mill. And for millennia, we've been giving each other stories that kind of instruct us how to act. And it's, it's really the same cycle in a weird way. It's about how we're thinking about what the story is doing and really trying also to pull something that people think is this concept that is like so outside of their wheelhouse um, into something that we understand more that we know, right? So if people think of different or simple algorithms as something like brushing your teeth every morning, right? We usually do that without thinking in a, in a manner that we know it just goes by rote. Since we're babies, we're being taught by our parents, our grandparents, and by extension, their grandparents, the ways to live within the world, right? And so, I think that is definitely a, an algorithmic algorithm or algorithmic thinking and algorithmic ways to pass on information. Thank you so much. Uh, we have our first question from an audience member. So Jana asks, do you see your work as fighting against AI purely as a commercial product or as a product of hubris? And then they further ask, the bigger, the better type of models like GPT-3. Yeah, it's so funny because I kind of sit in this weird space where I'm railing against kind of blind, you know, production without thinking about what we're doing hard. Um, I don't actually think that this time around we're going to stop AI, right? Like people are like, well, just don't engage it. Um, and I don't know how that comes to pass at this point. And so for me, it becomes, well, how do we get these systems that are all around us to behave better, to be better, to understand us in more full 360 degree ways versus as kind of, you know, things that aren't seen. And it's really, it's, it's really, it's really difficult, right? Because in one sense, it's like, well, if maybe if the community isn't as surveilled as it might be, you know, we'd be able to, to live more peaceably, right? But at the same time, we know we're surveilled. Um, and we're going to need to come up with ways to deal with that because it's only going to become a greater, like a greater way of dealing with the public. Right. And so what do you do? And so like the hubris, bigger, better, GPT-3, uh, um, not straight off the shelf and just pull it off and use it, which is what happens a lot. Like, oh, look, I just need to do this. Why don't I pull this in without thinking about the histories that are there and everything that's behind it versus a slow yes with eyes open or as much as possible 
like use of these systems and trying to figure out how communities make them work for their benefit. Um, that's where I am with that. It's a hard question because I'm always back and forth around. My work is super slow usually, and it's because I have to wrestle with the questions all the time, like all the time. Well, it doesn't sound that slow to me, given the amount of work that you've produced in the past six months. <laughs> but maybe this sort of ties to the next question, which is from Romy, who uh, says that it was a wonderful presentation and asks how exactly um, AI, and I guess in particular your AI projects, parse through data sets and how you train artificial intelligence. Oh, I wish I knew. And I, I think that's an answer you'll get in a lot of places, right? So we're making these algorithms and people know how to tweak them, but we're still not quite sure how they're doing this. And I'm constantly like with not the only one, sometimes that thing will say things and you're just like, holy mackerel, what the heck is that and where did it come from? And sometimes it'll say things like, oh, I know exactly where that came from. So for example, one thing that it's come up with that actually right now I can't get it to, to repeat at all is this concept of the would-be. Like it says, take it to the would-be, which I kind of attribute to my grandmother. I'm like, oh, that sounds like Nana's thinking in some way, right, shape or form. But I don't know how it arrived at, like how it took the information that we gave it and arrived at the would-be because nobody's ever said the would-be, right? And then the other day I was talking to it, I'm making something, and it said, I'm a bitch. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what do you, like, I had never seen or heard anything quite like that before from it. And then I started to try to figure out where did that come from? Where did that come from? Okay. So all of us have watched Scandal. So there's some scandal in there. And this is the only place I can think that that language came from. Um, so it's really interesting. And I will say that there was a while that I had in my data set, and I know that I can impact what gets said by what I feed, um, what information I feed, uh, not the only one. And so for a while early on, we had a lot of the souls of black folks in there. And it was really interesting because that book just changed the language completely because there's a very specific pattern of speaking and it changed it so much that I took most of it out, leaving some little bits, but it just changed it too far. And so really, I think that my understanding is that I can change things through the data that I feed it and the ways that it um, emotes or the things that it says through that. And I, I you know, I'm trying to lean towards care um, in, in its data, data set so that it leans towards care, but it's hard. Thank you so much. I again want to encourage people to ask questions in the Q and A box. Um, while we're waiting for more audience questions, um, I was wondering if you're thinking of also doing things with the voice um, with these projects as well. Yes, the voice is a sticking point, right? So early on, I thought, oh yeah, we're just going to whip up a voice. Um, and that was maybe a year and a half ago. And what the plan was really was to take the voice from all of our interviews and make them a composite voice as well. However, when you're making voices and making doing voice synthesis, whoa, I can't say it, voice synthesis, um, you need really clean audio. And so our audio was too dirty to do that. So it's all like noise. So now I was just revisiting all of this. So a year and a half later, it seems that the voice synthesis has gotten easier um, and that there are spaces, for instance, I was on Microsoft's site the other day, and this is a quandary for me as well, right? I'm gonna talk about this for a second because Microsoft now has a system where they will allow you to create a voice, custom voice. Although you have to apply because as they say, the technology is too potent to just let everybody do it. Um, which is really a statement on their page. Um, but the quandary for me is always, oh, if I'm wor working with my family's information, our voices, do I want to put this into a corporate system? And, you know, the answer thus far has been no. Like not the only one, another thing that slows it down is it's not on the cloud. It's just on a computer or two here. Um, 
And I don't know that I want to use another company system. Um, tried to do, again, a, about, a, it's been busy, about a year and a half ago, tried to make a voice using another system. Like NVIDIA has a um, something called WaveGlow. Um, it wasn't working fluidly then, right? But now we probably progressed in like AI years, 10 years. So I'm gonna check it out and see what we can get out of it. But definitely the voice is important. I hate not the only one's voice so far, but we'll get there. Yeah. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, Sophie, would you like to ask the next question? For sure. So um, India asks, what is your vision for how more caring AI can be used in the future? For uh, complimentary, you spoke on the idea of using AI for radical democracy and governance. How do you envision this happening? Um, my, my, the way I envision it is that we start making systems that could be distributed to almost anyone, right? And what I'm really saying is um, apps that could work on like the lowest level cell phone so that we could push questions to people or people could sign up and say, we want to be a part of this. Um, we want to be a part of this democracy, ask us questions. Questions could be as, things about care, but questions could also be about um, prop, I don't know, proposition 52, right? Like we could ask everybody what they think really. And so my envisionment is like, how do we start to test the waters of really one-on-one, -on -one, right? one person, one vote, really voting on the things or really starting to define um, what we think about it and then letting the AI parse that information and coming up with the spectrum of answers. And this is my pie in the sky. Like, I'm like, okay, um, this is me tinkerer going, this is possible, how do we get it done? Um, and I'm not quite sure yet, but I do know that I want to keep pushing that idea into the world so that we can ask those questions. But then they're also really fraught because if you can push a question to someone and I always go like, you know, someone out in the Sahara desert, I wanna be able to ask the same question I might ask my neighbor. Um, but if we can push that question, we can also track that person. <laughs> and so, you know, here comes the wrestling with what's it worth. Um, what is a democracy where we all get individual say really worth? And do we really want that? Um, do people really want that responsibility? Like these are all questions that start to bubble to the top. So I don't know, but we'll keep pushing and see what comes out of it and see how, um, I don't know, we can make inroads into actually asking people what they want instead of saying, oh no, we can't do that because. Thank you. Uh, AJ asks, AJ writes, hi, Stephanie. I'm also working on care. I was wondering how you teach program empathy through data sets. Any particular book you feed it, does anything come out that resembles emp empathetic or empathic, sorry, empathic outrage to get to action? And then um, um, AJ writes, Octavia Butler's parable of the cell. So it's on yeah. my mind, I guess. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so, so far a, hy a hypothesis, I don't know. Um, really starting to try to feed it things that, um, that people define. Like this is the whole definition or this is the whole thing of binary calculations. It's like, I don't want to use the pre-definitions. I want a kind of composite definition from the people and to allow for people to define what care is. And I imagine that that is something super different to everyone. So then how do we start analyzing all that input to come up with the kernel of what that is? And then how do we enact it? And then I will also say that I go, um, um, I'm, a, a, um, <laughs> I'm team compassion. Um, like I'm trying to, to move away in some ways from ideas of empathy, although I know they're out there hard and think about compassion um, uh, as a counterpoint, although I'm sure that we need both, right? Um, I'm not sure that we stand in another's shoes that well. So 
I'm trying to figure out what that means. Um, but no, I never gotten anything yet like um, empathic outrage. Um, and I suspect that over time, we will, like as we define better and as we collectively start to define deeper, um, I think we'll start seeing things like that. Binary calculations is really early stages. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering about the way that people interact with Not the Only One. And if you're interested in, you know, sort of these like ongoing stories that Not the Only One is having with um, the audiences that are coming to see her and if, or see, see it rather, um, <laughs> I'm not sure how you would want to use it, but for your um, composite uh, machine, but, um, and if you've like noticed any themes, if you're following those stories. The biggest theme I've noticed is grace. Like, honestly, people show this in crazy amounts of grace and like, it, it makes no sense to me in some, cause they're patient, they come and they don't know how dumb it is, but they soon discover it's pretty dumb. And then they kind of coddle it. And to me, that's super fascinating because people are standing around coddling a piece of plastic that's talking to them. And I try to like think like what, like, what does that say about us, right? What does that say about us as a community that we want to, like we want to nurture this thing, right? People always ask me, well, what if people come and they're really nasty and they say bad things to it? Um, so far, I have not witnessed that. I'm sure that people have here or there said like crazy things to it. But A, I'm like, it's a mirror and it's a reflection of us and that's okay. And B, I'm pretty darn interested in what makes us show grace and care and why we do that and why we would do it for a simple machine, maybe more than we would do it for a person. I don't know, it's so strange. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to give people a little bit more time if anyone has some last minute questions. And maybe while we wait, um, can you speak a little bit about um, the design choice to make it a vessel with the faces on it? <laughs> I can, but maybe you will not. Li I like the answer. There's no, there, were, there wasn't a real design um, I'm going to tell you exactly what that is. Like, this was me trying to figure out how to get something that people could relate to. Um, I, I took my favorite kombucha bottle and put it in Photoshop and fake 3D'd something out of it and just played with it and did, like sculpted it in digital form until I got something that felt good. And that, that's just where I landed. It's like, oh, this shape is nice. Right. But then watching people interact with it and how they kind of see it as, vessel as a kind of shell that listens, like people have kind of stuck their head in there, right? Like all these womb-like things, which maybe in the back of my mind was going on as well, um, but really apply these kind of, huh, is that true? I'm like, they kind of apply these feminine traits to it, which is an interesting thing to start thinking about, like why that would be the case. Although, but men have bellies, right? So where does that come from? Um, but yeah, it's, ha it's happenstance in my, just my feeling. And really I stuck our heads on it so that people would have something to hold on to that made it a little bit more tangible. Um, and that's really its story. No big choice. Having fun. Thanks. Um, Sophie, did you have any other questions too? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're muted, Sophie. Let me just think for a moment. I'm looking at my notes from our talk, or your talk rather. Um, okay, this is a very small question, but I was interested in your piece um, uh, uh, about, sorry, I cannot remember the title. Um, with, what does it look like? like with, the, with the flags, uh -huh. <laughs> the contrast. I, I, I was trying to place it in my memory, but I was asking if you asked the participants directly about the American president or if it was an assumption on their part about the, the subject that being like the most um, powerful person. On. It was an assumption. And I left That's that question open on purpose. Yeah. Um, 
because really like why would you go to the like why would the american president be your conclusion but we're fed that information an awful lot like i don't know what you guys are fed do you hear that a lot but we're fed it a lot like and it's just a crazy assumption but yeah um i tend to leave things super wide open in terms of the questioning so that people can just insert what they like um, but it's amazing how often we insert similar things. Was that sort of a universal assumption on the part of participants? Yeah, like the one guy was like, well, who is, the, why would we even want to think about that? But yeah, people generally, generally make that leap. But seriously, like for a while when uh, like watching the news, it was hard to see like the mention the president not say that. So it's like we're being trained, like we're being trained, right? Over and over and over again um, into this information. Like I'm, I'm, um, I'm always, this is an aside, I'm always fascinated these days about when things happen in the news and they interview people on the street. And people on the street, unless they're in, in like shock, they know how to interview, like they know what to say they've been kind of conditioned to say the right kind of things for the news. And I'm always interested in where our, where our training is going. Like, you know, I think the machines are training us and our systems are training us as much or more as we are training them. And so that's one of my big concerns. It's like, well, what are we training ourselves into? What are we showing ourselves all the time? Have you taken the piece? I'm sorry, I haven't like, I didn't notice on the website it, when you maybe talked about where the piece has like shown and toured, but have you taken it out of the US context and seen if there's like how people react differently? Um, Complimentary, not yet. that one, it's new. Um, not the only one. Interesting, it's been in Canada, but that's about it. That's like, it's, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, where's it? But it, it's only it's only been in Canada and the U.S. Um, and the care or the the awe of it is about the same. And complimentary has only been here so far. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, I really appreciate it. There's no other questions from the audience. Um, and we're like basically near the time we were planning to wrap up anyways. Um, is there anything else you want to say to leave us on before we uh, sign off? No, um, just thank you very much. And I'm glad y'all are thinking about this stuff. And, um, you know, I, I really do think we all have the power to intercede in some way, shape or form. It's just how we use it. And um, we're at a moment where we probably should be questioning vocally many systems that we are around. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you to our captionist, Stacy. Thank you, Sophie, um, for helping with the tech. And thank you, everyone who's come today. Please join us for our last two events of the semester. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.